Good morning, everybody. <laughs> ah, there you go. If I channel my inner, inner Don Taylor, you're all with me. Okay. Um, so hopefully you're all here at day two. How about a big whoop for day one? Was it any good? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. And a, how about a whoop for excitement for day two? That's not quite the excitement level I was looking for, but we'll, we'll go with that for now. It's early, early days. Um, how many of you here know already of the great work of Towards Maturity? Quite a lot of you. How many of you are here thinking, I don't yet, but I will by the end of the session? Fabulous, fabulous. I've known Laura for quite a few number of years now, and the longitudinal work that they do is absolutely brilliant. I'm your chair today. My name is Joe Cook from Lightbulb Moment, and I'm Lightbulb Joe on Twitter. And I work around the virtual classroom and webinar area, and so much of what Laura does is really relevant to me because there's such a lot of amount of work that Towards Maturity does that all of your organizations can pick up something and take it away. Today is going to be really interesting. We're going to hear a, a little bit from Laura, from her reports and data about learning culture, which is why you're all here. But then what we're going to do is go into an activity for you guys to work in pairs and really get some good quality take homes. So you may have heard Don Taylor talk about the bridge part of the activities of the sessions, which is really helping you translate from what we talk about in the conference to what you can do at work. We don't have a five minute bridge section today. We've got a half an hour bridge activity for you and it's absolutely fascinating. Um, so without any further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Laura and she's gonna tell you far more than I ever could. Thank you, Joe. Thanks everybody. It's great to be here. Um, 20th anniversary of learning technologies and we've been involved with this, this amazing event for the last 15 years when we launched our very first research report. And I am not going to bore you with research in a session that's about culture, that's about people, that's about behavior, that's about the things that are really kind of giving us the opportunity for change in, as learning professionals. Um, but what I am going to do is to share with you some evidence today that we can then put into practice to think about what does that mean for my own organisation. Now we're going to be uh, sharing, um, Joan is here sharing on hashtag T2S4 for this session. So if you are a Twitter person, then do, uh, do share using those hashtags as well. I'm Laura Overton and this is the work of At Towards Maturity. So we want to talk about culture and learning culture today. And what we found in our research with literally thousands upon thousands of learning leaders around the globe is that we are hungry to do some exciting things in our world of work. We don't just want to deliver efficiency and improve process, uh, but we want to really boost the performance of the organization to cultivate cultivate agility within the organization, and to influence culture. Over 95% of participants in this year's Health Check program said this was important to us. So we're going to hone in on this culture thing, influencing culture. And before we actually do that, I would like you to kind of pick up a piece of paper from the center of the table and a pen. Or if you like to write notes on your, on your, on your phone, go for that. And I would like you to think about your job right now in your organization. Now, you may be head of learning and development. You may be a, a content designer. You may be the managing director of one of the amazing uh, exhibitors downstairs. You may be a customer service person or a project management person. I would like you to think about your job in your organization and think about this question. For your organization that you work in right now, what would a great learning culture be? How would you describe it in just a few words? Now, if you're an independent consultant, you are the only ones in this room who is, has permission to think about a customer that you're working with right now. Okay, but only, only if you are a completely independent consultant. Everyone else, I would love you to spend a few moments writing those words down. What does a great learning culture look like in your organization? How would you describe it? And then, once you've done that, turn to a couple of neighbours, twos and threes, and just share some of those ideas. So, I'm going to give you a couple of mi uh, moments of quiet. Are you 
put an exercise in right up front so you can work out if you're jingling or jangling anywhere. So, Now, when you've done that, just turn to your, your neighbours at the moment and just share a couple of those things. Just to get to know each other, have a quick chat. I've asked Joe to roam the room a little bit and see what kind of words we're starting to use that describes a great learning culture. So if I can have your attention back for a moment, that would be great. Back in the room, back in the room. <laughs> Thank you. Joe, choose a table. Let's find, don't worry, she's really kind, which is really lovely. Despite what it looks we like. We just find, just find a, so a couple of words that describe learning culture from that table. So a couple of words on learning culture. Uh, we are a quite big company, so we are talking a lot about cross-functional and collaboration. That is really important, and how do you, how do you get there? Okay, so collaboration was one of the words for a great learning culture. Anyone else have collaboration uh, in the room? Great, so thank you for that. Um, any, any others? Curious. Curiosity. Does that describe for anyone else? Yeah, brilliant, thank you. A couple more. Rewarding, we've had from the, uh, from the front of the room. Anyone else has got rewarding as a part of the culture? Okay, that's a good one. Um, empowerment. Empowered, empowerment. Yeah, okay, that's a good one as well. We've had a couple of this. Oh, there's one from you as well. Energized. Energized. Has anybody else got that? So this is learning culture. We've got kind of rewarding, we've got collaborative, we've got curiosity, we've got energizing. Any others who've got other, other examples there? And the value of self-directed learning. Self-directed and the value, appreciating the value of self-directed. Did anyone have that one? That one normally comes up quite a lot on Learning Technologies Conference, <laughs> yeah. A corporate culture that values the time required to invest in the learning. So a culture that values the time requires, gives time to learning. Did anyone else have the, co oh yeah, you've got, you've got a lot of hands up on that one. Fantastic, thank you. We haven't had any from that end of the room. Let's have one or two. Um, we had sharing. Sharing. Open-mindedness. Open-mindedness and sharing. So that kind of very much links into the first one we had on collaboration um, as well there. So anyone else had sharing? Yep, yeah, coming through. Okay, uh, value people and their capability. An, a culture that values people and their capability. And again, let's see how we got. So you've got a good one there, got a unique, the pointless one, isn't it? Yeah. Anyone? Okay, so let's think about that. You've got those words on your pa papers in front of you, thinking about your organisation. Now, right now, in your organization, on a scale of one to 10, how do you feel that you're faring on delivering against that great culture that you've got written on your piece of paper right now? With one, uh-uh, we are so far away from this, I can't even imagine it. To 10, you know what, the words on this piece of paper absolutely describe who we are right now. So on a, on a scale of one to 10, give yourself um, a scale and a number. That's great. In ter so in terms of where you think against those words. Great. So just a quick show of hands. How many are right in the middle? Five? Yeah? OK. How many of you are between five and seven? So six and seven. Great. Any nines and tens? Great, I'd like your names because you're going to be coming up here a little bit later. So thank you so much for that. What about twos and ones? Yeah, and the threes and fours. Okay, so typically, being a data person, few of us are, um, are actually feeling that we're actually achieving this culture. And I think this is important, really, because 
When you are not alone, and I think that's a key thing for us that we would like to say, is that we ask people, you know, 95% of participants in our health check want to influence culture, and yet very few actually feel confident that they're doing that. In fact, only 23% uh, feel as though they're actually making a really positive influence. Self-directed, you were talking about there, only 24% of us believe that we're doing that. And this facilitating continuous learning the collaboration, sharing. I have only chosen three here, but you know, these characteristics, there's fewer than one in five or a quarter of us are, are really successful at this. And we've been wanting to achieve this change in culture for quite a while. So in terms of learning culture, you know, what is it and why is it so important? Now, it's really interesting. Every one of you will have a different description of what learning culture is for you and for your organization. And you know what? That is OK. But one of the things that everything had in common that we were talking about earlier is that it wasn't just about us. It wasn't just about learning, but it was about how we get the rest of the organization to connect, to value, to share, to collaborate with the things that we're doing. And I, I love, if you haven't seen it yet, you must get Nigel Payne's new book on workplace learning, How to Build a Culture of Continuous Employee Engagement. You know, it's, he's, it's packed full of lots and lots of useful ideas, and Nigel's definition it brings together a number of the words that you were talking about where learning and work have become completely intertwined, where staff take it on themselves, not just to learn, but to share, to respond, and to turn that learning into action. It's almost like every day is a bridging activity. Every day gives us something to be able to do. And even 25 years ago, Peter um, um, Senge, in his uh, fifth discipline, was talking about a learning organization as being people working together collectively to enhance their capabilities. So again, skill, the capability issue. But the whole thing about this is, it's how do we work together? How do we connect? How do we share? And I found last year's um, tea note yesterday very inspiring because she says we don't have to be experts. So we want to influence learning culture, but we can't own the culture of our organization. It's too diverse. It is the rituals, it's the behaviors, it's the histories um, that make up what our organization is. So that is really critical for us to grasp right up front. Now, some of the work that we have done at Towards Maturity is to look at characteristics of high-performing learning cultures. Now, I'm going to share with you this picture, but we're not going to go through it in a lot of detail because at the end of this session, I'm going to give you an email address that you can just email, and the reports, if you're interested in anything we've spoken about today, you'll be able to receive that almost immediately. But the concept that we found, high-performing learning teams have got this shared common purpose. They've got an environment where learning professionals and business leaders are working together to give that continual holistic experience for an individual that there is a thriving ecosystem of the way we connect and engage. Using technology absolutely has a role and a play in that. That continual engagement, that intelligent decision making, that we gather in feedback within the organization and use that to continually change. It's all about helping the organization to be agile, adaptive, and responsive to change. Now, this is an ideal world. But because we've got a lot of data, we've been looking continually to say, well, how do we get there? And what we found is that most learning organizations, most organizations go through a series of stages. And those stages, um, kind of, we can get stuck in those stages. We might be here, we can get some great results in this kind of transactional learning and development. We might be having great learning management systems, great e-learning, and getting some superb results on efficiency and processes. But we're not necessarily really getting that experience going yet. So it can work well, but on the next stage, we're really looking at how do we get high-performing programs in place, experiences, interventions? How, what's our role in really helping people to connect and bridge what we do back into the workplace? We also then find at the next stage that people start to look beyond just learning and development programs into talent strategies and how do we help people stay connected, stay engaged? And ultimately, it's this high-performing learning culture 
a culture where actually all of us are working together. This is a place of shared responsibility. And that's why it's so tough to get there. But actually, it's worth it. Those high-performing learning people, they're six times as likely to be re responding and saying they've got a positive learning culture. They're also more likely to have all of these other benefits of their learning strategies as well. And what's more, you can download the report on this, we see as well that the bottom line results the bottom line results for improving customer satisfaction, improving productivity, improving reven revenue, these all increase as well. So if we're making the case to somebody else to say, maybe it's time to share responsibility, maybe it's no longer not just me talking about collaboration or self-directed learning, but we need to come together with the business leaders this data has been put into our reports, again, you can have downloaded, so that you can have a new conversation back with your business leaders as well. So understanding that bottom line impact of creating a learning culture, a shared culture, is really important. The key thing about it that we found in this year's study is that those that are to the left of the curve are struggling massively with culture. Compared to those at the far right of the curve, they're nine times as likely to say our managers just aren't making learning a priority, and our staff ten times as likely to say our staff lack skills. On the other end of the journey, what we're finding here is that they are ten times as likely as these guys to be saying we're developing a positive learning culture and sharing good practice twenty times as likely. So this whole process of the journey has been really important for us. And what we were trying to do in this, in this environment is to say, OK, well, what's stopping us? What's pulling us back? And there are a number of extreme concerns that we uncovered, one of which was this cultural resistance. And we found that there's a lot of people were saying, you know, our managers don't get it, our learners haven't got the skills, and are reluctant to try some of these new ways of learning that we want to engage with. So rather than having this kind of culture of learning positivity, we're finding that a lot of learning professionals want to try so hard to change the culture and are getting increasingly, increasingly frustrated. It's almost like this kind of blame culture that's coming on us, and, it's, and it, we're really, really struggling um, with that as an industry at the moment. And if we are thinking that everyone else doesn't want it, and we're the only ones who want to change that culture, we're going to be in a stuck place. So what I want us to do today is to really start to think about what we can do as individuals in our own world of work to actually start to influence culture. And I want to share that with you. Because one of the challenges that we've found in this year's study is that three in five of us think that our managers and our organizations that we're working with have got very traditional expectations that are incredibly difficult to challenge. Um, that they're used to courses. They've read something on a plane about virtual reality, and they say, I want everything to be virtual reality. You know, there's, a, there's this kind of expectations of our leaders that we all typically think are the ones that are influencing culture that kind of stop us. And it's, it's almost like a biggest danger zone. It's a real problem for us. If, those, if you were at our uh, launch last night, we were talking about the journeys we're on. And, and sometimes, you know, when you get those movie stories, you know, you're halfway through the movie, and the hero is, like, stuck, and they can never get out, and they're going to die, and everything's going to go horribly wrong. This is one of the danger zones that we see in learning and development right now, is this concept that in our organizations, there's this view of institutionalized learning, that everyone else expects learning to run on the same old tracks that they've always had. Their learning management system, their dull as ditch water compliance training, their classroom courses, and everyone's in that mentality and no one can get off the track. So what we looked at this year is to say, okay, well, how do we, what are those high-performing teams doing to address culture, to address collaboration, to self-directed learning, to address a reward, that rewarding experience that we talked about as well. And so what we did was that we looked at the data in a different way, but we've also been researching externally as well. And I think I came across this article on um, Harvard Business Review, which I think is very, was liberating um, for me 
was this concept that culture change is not necessarily something that's mandated from the top, and we've got to wait till those business leaders get the fact that we need a learning culture, but it's actually more of a movement. And it's actually more about the wind in our sails. And if, we, if the wind of culture is actually moving through your organization, how do we catch what's going on already and move in the same direction? How do we leverage existing culture? Because when that wind of culture is moving against us, it's really difficult. And this article was talking about the fact that when the culture change needs to happen, what happens is often it can start with a movement. It can start with, with people. It starts with small groups. We gather a little microclimate. We encourage it. We make it change. We start to see how, who else picks up on that. And this concept that you know we're not always tacking against the full blast, but we can catch the movement in our own organization that will really support cultural change. And I found that as a liberating kind of concept, because maybe there's something we can do as individuals. So what we did was it actually looked a little bit further in the research that we've been doing and working with organizations, particularly through the work that we use with learner intelligence, we started to look at, okay, what outputs do we want? We want outputs of, um, we want outputs of people applying learning. Uh, we want outputs of people continuing learning. We want outputs of people reporting that they're engaged. And we explored, of those types of outputs, who influences that within your organization. And we find that there's a real mix between the individuals, the managers, and also the organization itself, those of us who are in learning and development. So we can't necessarily control everything else that's going on out of our sphere, but we can control what's going on from an organization perspective, from our own perspective, our role in shaping that learning culture. Now, I think it's quite interesting that we've been doing this for 15 years, and obviously 15, it's a nice round number. It always gives you an excuse, a bit of a retro thing. And I went back to the first report that we launched here at Learning Technologies in 2004, and what I looked at was I had forgotten it was in there. There were 16 organizations took part who were all high-performing at the time. And one of the things that they did was that they aligned their strategy and their learning strategy to the culture of the business. And there were four or five different examples where they had described the culture of the business and then how they adapted their learning strategy to catch the wind and to make change happen. There were some really interesting um, examples here. Here's, here was just one. It was a global organization. Coming back to your point earlier, everyone spread absolutely everywhere. And every of them had different cultures. So what they did, just in their learning strategy, was they made sure that oh, there were flexible guidelines adapted to local cultures, acknowledgement of local cultures, so that the programs weren't contrary. Little things, small things, practical things that they could do. Now, there's a concept here of e-learning. Back in 2004, e-learning did not mean what it means today. E-learning at that point in time was only a couple of years after the term had been been uh, de developed and it actually created all of the e elements that we see in learning today, which is about social, it's about collaborative, it's about resources, not courses. Funnily enough, back at the time, that's what e-learning meant. I'll move on from here <laughs> at this moment. But I think the key thing is, is that we can shape culture. If we're to the left of the curve, if we feel that this is the stage we're at in our journey maturity, we've got incredible roles as producers incredible roles of producing experiences, modeling what this might look like. When we move to the right of the curve, our role as producer doesn't shift, but what happens is we start to also embrace the role of enabler, of facilitator within the organization itself. So I think one of the key things for us that we found is that actually, wherever you are on this curve, you can make a difference in the roles that you're playing right now. If you're designing your compliance training to go on the, on the learning management system, you can make a difference. So what we looked at, and I'm just going to um, share with you a few ideas so that we can then start to say, okay, well, what does this mean for me? So if any of the things that I share quite quickly pop up or resonate, make a... Make a mental note, because we're going to be, we can be coming back to that. 
So what we did is to break through this kind of institutionalized view of learning in the workplace, we looked at those organizations that were reporting that they were changing culture, that there was self-directed learning was prevalent, and they were facilitating continuous learning. We looked at that, and then we isolated in our data, excuse me for a bit, the little bit of the geeky stuff, all of the tactics that correlated strongly back to that. Let's break this down. Let's look at a scientific approach to the evidence. Now, Rob Reiner says evidence-based practice is about taking all different types of sources of evidence, the scientific stuff, your own evidence, and using that to make the decisions that work for you. So I'm going to share with you just some of the evidence that we found out that consistently correlates back so that you can start to say, OK, uh, there might be a few things there that I'm not doing at the moment that might be easy for me to start working on. Now, what are those things? First thing was this concept of tuning in. Now, I mentioned before, we run um, with a lot of organizations, over 50,000 uh, workers have taken part in our learner intelligence program, which is not a program of going out to business and saying, you know, what do your learners think? Do, you, do they want blended? Do they want slow mobile? You know, all of those kinds of things. Nothing to do with preferences. You know, I think the key thing about preferences is, is that we'll always prefer the thing that probably is bad for us. I would always prefer a glass of wine. Right now, it's a glass of water that I need. So we go out to workers, direct us through to uh, junior people and say, look, how do you learn what you need to do your job? Where do you go? What, what is your learning culture for you? Let, get, let's get you to reflect on it. And what we found is that actually there is a wind and a movement and a change already going on in the organizations that most of us are working with. Now, we've done these learning landscape programs in, um, in, in the NHS. We've done it in large multinationals. We've done it in small organizations. We've done it in pharmaceuticals. We've got really diverse cultures. And the, typically, the pattern is the same is that our workers are starting to create their own culture. And again, this data you can take, you can download it. The critical thing is, and the examples we have here, is it's not the young ones that are doing this, it's not the old ones. Everybody is starting to think differently about where they go, how they collaborate. And it was amazing, 91% of the 10,000 workers said that they're already collaborating, and it was one of the most essential things that we're doing. And yet, it's so difficult for most learning professionals to actually help and facilitate and achieve that. So there's already a wind of change. And what we found those high-performing organizations did, those tactics, is they're tuning in. They're being proactive in going out and listening. They're also involving users in design. We talk about design thinking. But it's about tuning in, putting down my agenda to tune into yours. I may not agree with it. I may think that you ought to be tuning into my agenda as a learning professional. After all, I'm the professional. But they're not. They're laying down their agendas and tuning in to their customers. And one of the things that they're doing is that they're starting to understand what's important to customers and to learners. And recognition is important. And though that is one of the things that they are adapting to tune in. The other thing that they're doing as well, apart from tuning in, is they're starting to transfer ownership. What do I mean by that? They're starting to help individuals take responsibility for their own learning plans. And that can start at a point when they join the company. So if you're being faced with the issue today that actually it's just, uh, you're just coming in, you've got to do a great onboarding program, and you're coming here to Learning Technologies to find out how to do onboarding brilliantly, just helping people to think through right now how to help people on an ongoing basis to take responsibility for their own learning, you will start to influence the culture within your organization. Supporting career development. To what extent are the learning interventions that we're developing also lined up into the way that someone can see their selves, themselves progressing through the organization? Using available support systems, not just pulsing everyone into the learning management system, but where are people hanging out to get skills and to change ideas? How do we harness that? And you can see how the curves go for these high-performing teams. But these aren't things that you only can do there. What we wanted to do was isolate tactics that you can start doing here. 
These are the things, the decisions you can make today on the projects you're having to deal with right now when you go back to work in such a way that you can actually start to build the foundations that will influence culture and change. And then there's just a few more that we identified in terms of integrating learning and work. Managers actively supporting the application of learning. Now, you might say, I can't, I can't inform the managers. I can't get them to do what I want them to do. But maybe you can. Maybe there's something that you can do to help them to do this. So there's a number of things that we found. They're, sim they're quite simple things. You're tuning in, transferring ownership, a number of those different areas. Um, I think what it allows us to do is to say, OK, if the evidence says that, how do I take it? As Joe said, we're going to be bridging into, into how do I use this? Because what we've seen time and time again, not just in this year's study, but these are mirrored in studies for at least the last five years. And if you were that interested, you can download all of our last five years' reports. I wouldn't because we kind of updated it a little bit now. But this stuff that we've just been talking about, this works consistently, small businesses, large businesses. And there are things that we can do, we can apply it to our understanding of our own organization and also our own skill, our own capability of where we're at right now. We can pull all of these things together and start to apply it to make some decisions where we can influence culture. So I wanted to share this with you. And as I say, at the end of the session, um, I'm going to give you an email address and you can just download all of this, all of these slides, everything else. But really, we're here because we want to shift the dial on influencing culture in our own organization. We want to be able to start to say, OK, well, what can I take away? Now, I've spoken with Joe and I've spoken with Don about this. And what we wanted to do was to try something a little bit different with you guys. Um, one of the things we found in this year's study is that we want to see change but the majority of us feeling just overwhelmed, often under-equipped, and just haven't got the space to even think anything through. So what we wanted to do is to start to help give you a space in this event to say, OK, OK, Laura's just pummeled us with loads and loads of different ideas, but what the hell do I do with them? What does it mean to me? What does it mean for the three words that we've written down on those pieces of paper? And what we would like to do is to borrow from some work right now from the amazing Nancy Klein. Who knows Nancy Klein and Time to Sink? Has anyone, anyone heard this? OK, I'm going to get a whistle-stop tour um, of, of, this, of this process now. What Nancy Klein is saying is that actually we have the ability within ourselves to come up with our own solutions. We are great thinkers. And when we've got the space to think, the permission to think, the permission to just work stuff out and the time to do it, then we can come up with some of our best solutions which are uniquely appropriate. And it's quite a tough, a tough call because it actually involves um, a number of things. It involves us actively listening to each other. So what I would like us to do, now please don't Please don't do it right now. What I'd like us to do, we're going to get into pairs and to help each other, give each other's time to think for the rest of this session. And it's a process that we can follow. I'm also going to say, I'm going to give you permission as well. In a moment, we can stand up, stretch our, so find a partner, sit down again. At that point of standing up, if you don't like the idea of this exercise, you really can't, can't cope with it, you are free to go. And I want to say that to you, absolutely. There's loads of things that you can be doing. But I have done this exercise, and I found it incredibly hard. But as a result of stretching myself, I think it's really transformed my thinking. So if you want to have your thinking transformed, please stay with us. And this is what we're going to be doing. In the envelopes on your table, um, please open them. There's a sheet in there for absolutely everybody. If you haven't got one, share it around quickly. Have we got that one? Well, if, you, if you have got some free ones, can you hold them up and then we'll just recirculate? 
them, got a few over here, we'll make sure, perfect. And the whole idea of Nancy Klein's work is that some of the most valuable things that we can offer to each other is giving ourselves the framework to think. So if you're going to be pairing up with someone and you are going to be somebody's listening partner, the most valuable thing that you can do to the person you're paired up with is to give them a framework and a structure to think things through. Now, this is the most counterintuitive thing that I had ever done, particularly those of you who know me. You know, I've always got, I've always got a data point. I've always got something I can share with someone to help them. You know, if you're really hungry to help people, you always want to help them and give them something. What we're saying here is that actually we want us to be paired up and as a listening partner, we would like you to give your partner the space and the time to think through a challenge. Now, the idea, there are some underlying rules here, that if you're giving somebody the chance to say, okay, well, how can you, how can you influence culture in your organization? Tell me what you think. You might start to share with me, okay, I've got some things going on right now. There are some problems, some challenges. Our role as a listening partner is to say, um, what else do you think? And what else do you think? Just to look, to take notice, to be appreciative. Even if that person, we were practicing it earlier, I was saying to Joe, if I said to Joe, um, you know, I don't agree with a single thing she's thinking right now, just to keep my mouth shut. Because the whole idea of giving someone the opportunity to think out loud means that you're respecting them as a thinker. So we're going to kind of pair up we're going to go through this process and give ourselves like 10 minutes for one person to go first. And as if you are the thinker rather than the listening partner, your role as a thinker is just to work through that question in your mind, thinking about your own organization. This is Chatham House Rules. I'm going to say in a moment, any minute, we're going to turn the video off. And it's Chatham House Rules so that you're free to actually discuss whatever you want to discuss or think about in terms of this challenge. As a listening partner, there's a few guidelines on this piece of paper for you. <laughs> Provide space. If there's, if there's silence, let it go. Don't dig in. Hardest thing ever. Particularly if you're a consultant, don't do it. Particularly if you're a learning and development person, do not do it. You're not here to train. You're here to give your partner the space to work stuff out on their own. It's really exciting how you can surface that. You might notice five, six minutes in that, that you've noticed some, there's some things that might be kind of, kind of stopping people from moving on, a, an assumption that they're making about their environment that may or may not be true. And at some point, you might want to ask this, what might you be assuming right now that could be stopping you? That's a question, that's a good question to ask and get your partner to say, well, actually, maybe I'm assuming that the managers aren't interested at all. Then you can ask a different question, an incisive question, say, okay, well, let's assume the managers are interested. What else could you do? So as a thinking partner, it's keeping quiet, keeping silence is okay, allowing people to talk about their feelings is brilliant, creating a safe space, making your partner feel really, just be really passionately curious. What are they going to say next? You know, just give, create that environment. But if you see them maybe making us some assumptions after five, six minutes, don't push in. Just ask that question there. Is there anything? Okay, let's flip it with an incisive question. So the whole idea of this is that we get a chance to think about what we can do and what we will do. It's going to be tough. But is, is anyone here willing to give it a go? Anyone? Thank you. And the rest of you, thank you for staying. I'd like to suggest to you that we do just stand up, roll your shoulders. If you're sitting next to someone that you know you want to change, then that's fine. Now, and then take a seat, and we'll get started. Great. So if you'd like to, like to take a seat, decide in your pairs who is going to go first in that environment. If you haven't got a pair, put your hand up and we'll, we'll pair you off with someone. So there's, a, there's somebody over here. Perfect. Great. Now, I'd like you to just give this a go. Now, if anyone is having a, a struggle with this, 
put your hand up. Give it a good couple of minutes beforehand, but if you're struggling with it after a couple of minutes of just letting the person talk, you need a little bit of a helping hand, put your hand up. Jane Daly, our Chief Insight Officer, she's a Nancy Klein uh, practitioner. Um, she'll be able to help you. Joe will be able to help you. But I would like to now give you permission as a thinker to just start to think out loud about this challenge. How can you in your organization, not your customers, but how can you in your organization actually influence culture? And please feel free to start this exercise right now. Good luck. Go for it. And this shouldn't normally happen. I wouldn't want to interrupt your thinking. But you know what I want to do is, if you ha want the opportunity to swap, then that's absolutely fine, and let somebody else. If you want to continue, that's absolutely fine as well. The whole thing about a thinking environment is that, that you're, you don't have to talk while you're the listener, because you know, you know you're going to be appreciated as well. Jane's got a couple of observations before we then go into the next uh, two minutes or ten minutes. Jane. Yeah, so um, look, thank you for your participation. Just as a practitioner who's been doing this for a while, the people that are talking, Give yourself time to think. It's okay for both of you to sit there in silence because I'm seeing you talk, but I'm not seeing you think. Does that make sense? Bit of advice. It is, it is weird, but I want you to bring up some new things. If you're not talking new stuff, you should be surprised by what you're even saying. If you're not, stop. Let your brain work. That's my advice. Enjoy. So you can either carry on the one conversation for another 10 minutes or choice to swap. Completely down to you. You have permission to think now. <laughs> I'm hoping that that little gift of time in the middle of a busy day, that the gifts that you've given each other of stopping and listening and giving each other attention and a bit of space may have generated some ideas for you that can, you can go back at work. Thank you so much. I got a nod in the front row. I'm loving this person forever. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how many of you, when you were listening, found it the hardest thing in the world not to interrupt? Isn't it tough? Isn't it tough, particularly when we as individuals we're there to help other people. How many of you, when you felt really listened to, that suddenly your mind started to generate a few ideas? OK. Was it liberating? Yeah? Yeah? Brilliant. On the back of the piece of paper, I'd really like to ask you just to quickly reflect in a clear sentence. Is there, is there one thing? Is there one thing out of that exercise that you think you can do maybe to influence culture now back at work? It may be introduce this exercise to get healthy people listen to each other. But is there one thing? It would be really great just to stop for a moment and reflect um, on something that might have bubbled up that you think you might be able to do in your role to influence those three words that you put down on your piece of paper. Just make a note of that. Now we've got a couple of moments. Would anyone like to, don't feel you have to, would anyone like to actually share um, one of the ideas that they've had about influencing culture in their role at the moment? Even if it's something short? Anyone be willing to do that? Great. Take the photograph because... Maybe you can take a photo of your, of your piece of paper, maybe tweet it out. Um, save the pieces of paper and we will collate them for you and then get let, lots of people's individual ideas. If you want to share, leave them on the table, we'll curate them and bring them together for you um, as well. Okay. I think culture change is something that takes a long while, which is why we, if we look at our own individual role, those small things that have surfaced today, that we can do today, it's worth doing. 
because it takes a while. I mentioned before about we get, have a health check in our strategic intelligence work which allows people to reflect on their current strategy. It takes, it takes quite an effort. It's about 45 minutes to go through that health check. But year on year, we're surfacing these sorts of things that we've been talking about today. And what we found when we looked this year about those who've been doing the health check for the first year versus doing it a couple of, of years versus doing it three years, persistently keeping coming back to some of the things that we've been talking about today, we start to see that it actually takes a while to really influence culture. So these small things that we can do today, these small changes potentially will make a big difference, but not immediately. It's going to be in the long term. But a thing I wanted to kind of share with you today is the fact that it's within our own um, ability, our own sphere of influence. We can make a difference. We don't have to wait for the learning leader or the business leader or the head of department to start to do things. We could start to create this environment within our own team. Let's have a learning environment within our own team. Just talking to Joe, uh, you got you're a team of two, three, uh, two people. Every Friday, coming together, stopping, reflecting. What have we learned? What have we what have we changed? It might be something small like that. It might be the way that you're designing your onboarding program or your compliance program. You're thinking differently about the things that you can do that will also touch a little bit on culture as well. So I think it's very exciting. We do a lot of work in this field. Please come and talk to us if you would like some more information. And I think the key thing is, is the small changes make a big difference. Um, that we can influence the person we listen to. Just listening rather than just completely giving information now the whole time. That could actually start to change the way that we connect, that we collaborate, that we reward so I'm hoping that this session has been helpful for you today. Um, we have got an email address, but it's only available for the next couple of hours. If you email resources at towardsmaturity.org, just now, you don't have to say anything, you will get back all of the links back to the reports we've done. If you're shy and you don't want to tweet out your commitment or your thing, take a photograph of it and send it. Here, just so that it, it's gone off somewhere. Um, and as I say, we will take all of the ideas that you leave on the tables, that you send to us here, um, or that you tweet out yourselves, and we're going to pull that together. And anyone who's um, emailed this, we will then send that back out to you as a list of different things, different ideas that have been generated from this room. But I just want to say thank you. If you've liked having time... Please let Don know via the app in the feedback. Um, at least the guys who left as well, they got the gift of time as well. So as long as that's uh, it's good for everybody, then I think that's really important. Thank you so much for your attention. Do come and ask myself, Jane, um, of any, any ideas, any sorts. But please leave your, your um, ideas for influencing culture on the table. And together, we can make a massive change and be scoring a 10. But we saw that person over there with the 10. Next year, speaking engagement. <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone, for your attention and your listening skills as well. Thank you so much, Laura. If you want to come and have a look at that Nancy Klein book, it's here. You can't take it. It is Jane's. Uh, but you can come and have a look at it. My business card's up here as well. And of course, come and speak to Jane and also Laura with any of your questions. Enjoy the rest of your day.